We're going to teach this afternoon on casting out devils. How many of you hate the devil? Then why do we let the devil walk on us? Did you ever notice how many of us let the devil walk on us all the time? You have no idea. I have people who come up to me night after night and they say, Oh, the devil has been bothering me all week. He's been chasing me all week long. Oh, he's just been running after me. And I say, why don't you turn around and run after him? Don't you think that's a better idea to run after the devil instead of having the devil run after you? Because Jesus gave us more power. He said, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And he said, nothing shall by any means harm you. And you and something else that I think where it's wonderful in the word, it says, resist the devil and he will chase you. Is that what it says? What does it say? Resist the devil and he will what? He will flee from you. That's why we need to, to begin to understand that we need to resist the devil and to attack, I mean, and to attack him. We're not on the defensive. We're on the offensive. Amen. So you and I need to go out and aggressively attack the devil. Now, I also want to tell you this. Don't spend all your time looking for devils. Don't spend all your time casting out devils. Don't spend hours at night saying, well, I got 973 devils out of that person. Because I'm sure that Jesus never did it that way. Jesus spoke the word and they came out. By the same token, I believe that when we speak the word, the demons have to come out. Because the Bible says, at the, na at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The devil has to bow at the name of Jesus. But I believe with my heart and soul that the devil knows whether or not you believe you have more power than he does. Did you ever notice that he walks all over a lot of people that just don't have any power? He knows where he can get a foothold and that's why he loves to do it. And so this is why we need to stand up and we need to resist the devil and we need to let him run from us instead of us running from him. So many people spend so much of their time worrying about getting away from the devil that they spend all of their time running from the devil instead of charging after him instead. Well, that's one of the things that we hope we real, that you realize that we have so much authority in the name of Jesus. If we could only somehow or another understand the power of God that is within us when we have the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Do you know that's a power plant? I mean, that's like having dynamite on the inside of you. And all you have to do to let that dynamite go off is to touch somebody. That's the power of God just flowing out of you as you touch somebody. I just want to show you something. Everybody at every table, touch somebody. Just touch. Just touch. Now, don't hold hands. Just touch. Okay, now untouch. Now, somebody just got healed of a headache that was pressing on your temple. Who was that? Isn't that really neat? Isn't that really neat? Now, who touched you? That he touched you and she touched you. Do you see the power that we've got? You see, you just touch somebody and the power of God goes through. If we could only understand there is tremendous, unlimited power in our hands. Look at your hands. I want you to say, those are hands of power. Those are not weak hands. Those are strong hands. Because they have the power of God in them. And I'm going to use them more than I ever have before. You mean that, don't you? Ah, well, all right. How many of you really mean that? All right. Well, the, the devil comes in many areas. The devil loves to attack your mind. He loves to get you thinking his way. And how many of you know that it's not very hard to begin to think the devil's way? All of a sudden you get a little pain and you think, I wonder if that's cancer. You see a little lump 
come up on your body. Maybe you bruised yourself and didn't think about it. And all of a sudden you see that lump. You think, oh, I've got cancer. The devil's got you. Did you know that? Because he loves to attack your mind. He loves to put these nasty little thoughts in your mind. And of course, he starts most of them with fear. He always talks about things that you're afraid of. He always talks about things that you're afraid you're going to get and you'll die of them. As a matter of fact, many people, even Christians, are often afraid that they're going to die. Now, isn't that a silly fear to have? How many think it's silly to have a fear of death? Why, glory to God. Look where you'll be. Woo, glory to God. In the, in the twinkling of your eye, you'll be right up there where we all want to be. So why should we ever worry about death? Why should we fear death? I mean, I know all of us feel the same. We want to live. We want to raise our families. We want to see our grandchildren. But you know, when you come right down to it, wouldn't you rather see God? <laughs> oh, Hallelujah. So you see, there is that fear, and the devil tries to put it in, in, in everybody. One of the greatest fears that the devil puts in people is a fear of getting old. Did you know that? I'm so glad for me it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. I have no fear about getting old. I'm already there. Hallelujah. <laughs> But you know, that's one of the things that the devil does. He makes us think that when we get old, we're not going to be able to remember as well as we used to. Now, do you know that that's one of the devil's favorite tricks? Because, you know, as you get older, you just don't remember the way you used to when you were young. Now, I'll tell you what, if you'd like to look at some scientific studies, it shows that your, your mind does not lose its ability to remember. Now, maybe over the years, we've cluttered it up with too many things that were non-essential, but your brain does not disintegrate as you get older. Did you know that? It does not. So we should never worry about that. My mind is as sharp today, probably sharper than it was when I was 16, because now I possess the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. And when I was 16, I I was just serving the devil all over the place. As a matter of fact, I served in the first 49 years. But the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so he goes at you, first of all, through the mind. And he tries to, to tell you all these outlandish lies. God's word says, don't worry, because uh, we're not like the heathen. The heathen worry. How many of you worried the past week? Come on, be honest, be honest, be honest. You see, and yet God's Word tells us not to worry. Who is it that puts worry in your mind? The devil. You see, he just wants to totally possess that mind. He gets you worrying about something or another. Well, I'm worried that I might catch cancer. I'm worried that I might, I might get arthritis or something like that. And he gets you thinking on those negative things so that you cannot think upon the things of God. You know, God's Word tells us to think upon these things, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. He tells us to think upon those things instead of concentrating on the things that the devil tells us to think about. The devil has a sneaky way of coming up on people and laying diseases on them. How many of you know that? And we think, now how come God... How come did I get this particular disease? How many of you have ever seen saints of God that had cancer? I know for years people would say, well, a Christian can't have a, 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 a demon. You cannot be possessed by a demon because if you are possessed by a demon, you are no longer a Christian. But a Christian can most certainly be attacked by the devil. How many of you know that the devil doesn't have to attack the sinner? He's got him already. You see, he's got him already. That's why he doesn't need to attack. Although, uh, as I said that, I could not help but think about the way AIDS is spreading all over the United States and all over the world, as a matter of fact. And this comes from people having listened to the devil. The devil telling them that homosexuality is a way of life. The de devil telling them that they're born with a ho homosexual uh, spirit. I believe that's a total lie of the devil himself. And so they participate in these things which, which God says are so ungodly. All you have to do is read in his word what he has to say about there's not going to be one homosexual in heaven, no whoremonger, no liar, no thief. There's not going to be a one of them in heaven. And yet 
people continue to do come against these things. Now, over and over again, we are asked about the demonic spirit that causes AIDS, and what do you do? Is there hope for that person who has AIDS? Yes. Now, there is hope, but the hope depends on the person involved. I do not believe that there is healing for the person who has AIDS until they have totally repented. Now, repenting does not mean, I'm sorry I got caught. How many of you know that? A lot of people repent that they got caught. I mean, did you ever get picked up for speeding? You repented that you got caught. Now, whether or not you really repented depended on whether or not you cut your speed back after that to stay within the limits of the law. Can I hear an amen to that? You see, you haven't repented if you have not reversed what you were doing. And actually, repenting is turning around and going as fast in the other direction as you possibly can. But I believe that some one of these days, you're going to see somebody who has AIDS who is genuinely converted. In other words, who is genuinely sorrowful for the way they have behaved. They are sorrow. They are sorry that they are homosexual and they are going to turn completely from their way of life. I believe that that's when, that when a person does that, you won't have to lay hands on them for the healing of AIDS because healing comes in the atonement. And salvation actually includes healing. If we understood what healing was, uh, what, the, what salvation really was, we would all be healed totally the day we get saved. Uh, now, I knew nothing about healing. You see, Jews, Jesus took it all on the cross 2,000 years ago. Every sickness that you have was put on the cross 2,000 years ago. All of these AIDS patients was put on the cross 2,000 years ago as well. Now, first of all, has to come repentance. Without that, there is absolutely no hope for anybody with AIDS. But number two, now this is where we come in. Then you command a new immune system to come in. You see, their bodies, their, their immune system has been totally destroyed. That's why they get all of these diseases. I mean, they can get cancer, they can get arthritis, they can get anything that comes along and it can kill them because they have no immune system at all. They have no resistance to infection of any kind. That is why they are subject to all of these different diseases. So you speak a new immune system into them. And how many of you believe that God has plenty of immune system, uh, systems? How many of you believe God wants to save the homo homosexual? He certainly does. It's not God's will that they should perish, but God wants to. He wants to snare them out of the clutches of the devil. But unfortunately, so many of them are living in a lifestyle that they do not want to give up. They want to be healed old but the, I had another, a young man the other night in a line, and I asked him to, to pray the sinner's prayer. And I said, did you really mean that? I said, are you going to turn away from homosexuality, turn your back on sin, and are you going to walk with God the way you're supposed to and have nothing to do with homosexuality again? He said, no. I said, well, then, brother, don't ask me to pray for you. Don't ask me to pray for you because I cannot pray in all honesty when all you want to do is get healed so you can go back into the homosexual field again. I don't believe God will heal them for that reason. But I do believe that when God looks down at our hearts, he will see them. But we need to command that devil of homosexuality to come out. And believe me, there are people who have been totally set free of that spirit of homosexuality when someone laid hands on them. I'm thinking, I'm, uh, I'm in. I, I'm thinking right now of a young homosexual. Well, he wasn't really too young. I guess he was about 27 or 28 at that time, wasn't he, Charles? He came to one of our services, and he said to Charles, he said, "I have had the spirit of homosexuality cast out of me, but he said the desire is still there." He said, "Will you cast out that spirit again?" And Charles said, "No." 
Now you might say, why? Here is a young man crying out. Will you cast that spirit out? Charles said, no. He said, all you need to do is to make a total commitment of your life. He said, that spirit has been cast out. But he said, you need to make a total commitment of your life, giving everything that you are to God, and then see what happens to those desires. That was seven years ago. That young man looked at Charlie, he says, is that all I have to do? Now, how many of you know, is that all is really an awful lot? It's an awful lot. But he stood there and he gave all of his life to God. Today he is a successful evangelist and he's got the most exciting ministry. He's married to a lovely girl. They have a wonderful marriage and all those traces of homosexuality are gone. You see, nothing is impossible with God, but there has to be a desire in their heart to get rid of that homosexual spirit. I personally think that's one of the most difficult of all to get rid of. One of the most difficult of all to get rid of because along with that has to come that desire to straighten out. But you and I have more power than that homosexual spirit. Amen? Amen. And so it can be cast out. Now there's a transfer sometime of the, what they call AIDS through intercourse or other things and blood transfusions. So the first thing I do when somebody comes up uh, with AIDS if it's not uh, obvious that they're homosexual, I say, did you get this through homosexuality or lesbianism, or did you get it through some other means? And many times a woman will come up and she'll say that, no, it was because of my husband's uh, uh, homosexuality that I got it. Then she doesn't need to repent if it's a husband. Uh, a husband. If she's with a boyfriend, she needs to repent too. Well, here, praise God. While we're in this area and talking about casting out devils, there are so many new diseases that come up. How many of you have noticed that? There is a disease called herpes with which many people are affected. Now you see with us standing in healing lines every night, we hear of all these wild things that five years ago I never heard of. At least it was certainly played down then. But many people today, and I think it's because of this live in boyfriend, live-in girlfriend situation, and then we don't like who we live with, so we switch and we move with somebody else. I think that's what causes, but the tremendous number of people have herpes. Again, you need to bind the devil. Of course, I always ask them if they've changed their lifestyle because there is no hope until they change their lifestyle. And then I bind the devil in the name of Jesus, cast out that foul spirit that causes herpes, and then I command all those lesions to dry up and to disappear in the name of Jesus. Candida is another disease that is widespread in America today. Now, I don't know about overseas, but I do know in America that Candida is a widespread disease. I don't really understand exactly what candida is. I know it's a yeast infection. And I would say that probably 30 years ago, you would hear of an occasional person who said, well, I have a yeast infection. And nobody really understood what that meant. However, today, if, if I were to ask for a show of hands in here, there would be many of you who would raise your hands and say, well, I have a yeast infection or I have been diagnosed by the doctor as having a yeast infection. I don't really know what causes candida. Uh, doctor, do you know? I don't know either. I don't know if it's promiscuous behavior, which I don't think it is, but uh, sugar, sugar aggravates it. Sugar aggravates it. So if you have a yeast infection, I would most certainly suggest that you go off of sugar. Whether you have a yeast infection or not, I would suggest that you go off of sugar because I know that I feel 10,000 times better since I went off of, of uh, sugar. But candida is a foul spirit that can attack any part of your body. It can go into the bloodstream. Now, that's usually where it is. I saw a little diagram the other day. And it was showing all these little yeast cells that were in there. It attacks the female organs uh, a lot. It attacks the male organs a lot. But what you need to do, when in doubt, cast it out. When in doubt, what? 
Cast it out. So when you come at somebody who has a disease like that and you're not sure what it is, command the spirit to come out of them in the name of Jesus. Now every once in a while, you'll get somebody who'll have this real shocked look when you say devil, then say, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to that spirit that has caused that infection in your body. Arthritis is another one that is caused by a spirit aggravated by unforgiveness and bitterness as we spoke to you about but basically because it is incurable it goes back to being a spirit so you need to command that spirit to come out in the name of Jesus now here's another very interesting thing somebody came up to me in between the sessions and they said what about the spirit of inheritance now I have to tell you about a girl that got healed last night right here I had laid hands on her she told me that she had this numbness on one side of her body I, I did the neck thing on her because normally that will relieve uh, when you have uh, numbness in the arms it didn't do a thing so she went over to the doctor he examined her and uh, uh, and so she she told him a little bit more and then she came back to me again so I called him over not knowing that that she had been to him and I said doctor do you have any advice for me on this because you see a lot of times a doctor can give you a little bit of advice then which helps me in the spirit to know what to do and so he said well, she told me that her sister has the same thing. A bell rang. What is that? That's a spirit of inheritance. How do you break a spirit of inheritance? Now, this girl was as tight as a drum across her back. And, I, and so I just said, devil, I bind you by the spirit of God. In Jesus' name, you foul spirit of inheritance, I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. Now, here's something else that was interesting. I had laid hands on her twice before. She, there was no sucking out of the power, n nothing, none of that. She did not fall under the power of God. But when I broke that spirit of inheritance, she went ploop under the power of God. And when she got up, this whole back area was as soft as jelly, wasn't it, doctor? I examined it. The doctor examined it, too. It was as soft as could be. Now, you see, I was going up a blind alley because I didn't know that the sister had the same thing. So listen for these little clues that people tell you when they come up and they ask you to lay hands on them. Find out those little clues. If the simple, basic things that you have learned don't work to begin with, then start probing a little deeper and see what you can find out. Because that was one of the neatest cases that I ever saw of somebody who was totally healed when that spirit of inheritance was cast out. And that's exactly the way you do it. There are some families, especially in people of certain nationalities, who have had curses placed on the families. Uh, witchcraft is prevalent in many nations around the world, and there are many people who have had curses placed on their family. You can break that curse with the blood of Jesus. You just come against that devil with the blood of Jesus, and you command that witchcraft curse to be broken in the name of Jesus, and it will be broken any incurable disease we believe is a result of a spirit that has attacked the body now I know when we're first starting out we run into so many things that we don't really understand is that really a spirit now let me also tell you something else about the spirit of inheritance most people who have asthma or allergies like when people bring their children forward to you and most of the time it's their children they will bring and they'll say Johnny has really got allergies or Johnny has really got asthma the first thing you do before you lay hands on Johnny say mama do you have allergies because you see they're not telling you that it's something that is coming down through a family line so then lay hands on mama too or papa too whoever's got it and many times both of the parents will do it command the spirit of inheritance to come out of all of them then cast out the spirit of allergies and then cast out the spirit of asthma because you'll find those things are very very closely related together 
there are many, many diseases that are very common that uh, are caused by spirits. Charles, you want to show them uh, uh, how to uh, get maybe a spirit of, of bursitis or arthritis or one of those kind out? Is the man here that uh, had bursitis in his shoulder this morning. Uh, he came up and he said, I've got this bursitis in my shoulder and my arm. And so I said, great, that's easy to heal. Don't ever forget when you're ministering to people, well, that's easy. Amen. How many of you know it's easy for God? How many of you know where God's working through? Amen. You. And so I said, well, that's easy. And I just did not watch it go. I said, in Jesus' name, devil, I bind you by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, you spirit of bursitis, come out. And I just, I, I don't know why I do it. I just tap them when I command the Spirit to come out. And I said, now move your arm. And he did. He said, well, I just left. Isn't that complicated? Isn't that complicated? It's just so easy. Now, I want to give you a couple of things. First, Jesus, in uh, naming demons, gives you a real good clue of why you can re how you can recognize demons. He named them by what they did. You deaf spirit, you dumb spirit, you blind spirit, you epileptic spirit, you insane spirit, you come out. And we say, in the name of Jesus, you come out. And so because of that, uh, that's where we tie in uh, to the Bible on incurable diseases. All these things he mentioned are either physical incurable or they're uh, mind incurable. They've, they've let their mind be sucked into the devil. Uh, don't encourage the activity of demons. Don't go around witchcraft and uh, ESP and those things. You encourage the activity of demon and the devil gets a hold of you and then he'll finally try to possess your mind. Basically, your soul is the thing he's after and as he attacks really starting in through the flesh, into the mind, he's trying to get to your soul. And so he gets into these emotional things and Jesus said, you insane spirit, come out. That's a totally possessed person. But if you got bursitis, you've just been attacked in a physical realm. Now, uh, the first devil that I ever really knew anything about, uh, well, one woman came to my home before my wife died, and uh, and she was casting the cancer devil out. And I thought, really? So I got her alone. I said, tell me, what is a devil? Now, see, see my innocence? And that was only uh, 1969 that I'm asking her, 68 or whatever it was. Uh, I'm saying, what do you mean, demons? And so she explained a little bit, and uh, it's amazing how much you can learn that way. But uh, uh, one day, I had given everything over to God. I thought, well, God, you're probably, since my wife has died, you're probably calling me, because I heard something about deliverance. I said, you're probably calling me into a deliverance ministry. Did you know Jesus did not have a deliverance ministry? Jesus had a ministry that was complete and balanced to change whole lives. Don't get into deliverance. Don't get into a healing ministry. That surprised you, doesn't it? Get in the ministry to do what Jesus did. And his aim was to get their souls right with God. But you have to di drive out these devils. About a fourth of all the healings recorded in the New Testament were casting out devils. And you see about 70%, we think, are in dealing with, uh, with these TTT, the neck, the arms, the legs, and the pelvic. About 70% of those. And you've got these other things that are involved. And so we begin to look at uh, this. But uh, one day... Uh, I had, uh, 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 my wife had died. I had absolutely no grief, no loneliness, nothing, because God had spoken to me. It was supernatural. God told me all these different things in a, a direct way. It was beautiful the way God cleared me of all of that. But then uh, one day, all of a sudden, it was a bright, sunshiny day. I was going down the freeway singing glorious songs to God. I had yielded my life totally to God, and I pulled into a, a cafeteria. It was after the rush hour, and I... Get, got ready to get out of the car to go in to have a bite to eat. I'm just gloriously happy because of what Jesus is doing. And all of a sudden, it was like darkness came in. Not with my physical eyes, but it's like a weight came over, like I lost every friend in the world, like nothing was important. It just utterly came in as a horrible, horrible depression hit me. And uh, I turned to get out of the car, and I didn't have the baptism. I didn't know about demons, but I said, God... If that's the devil, 
get him out and draw close to me. And uh, literally that demon went shoo, just like that. And it was just like a sun burst out. And all of that is gone. And uh, that was a simple way that God was showing me in relation to demons. See, he was coming in to try to take advantage of a situation. The devil is a liar and a thief and a robber. And he came in to try to rob that peace that I knew that God was in charge of my life. And God was redirecting my life. And nothing mattered except that God would do that. I'm going to give you a, a couple of verses here. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies. These are demon spirits. Most of us think that it's a fallen angel that got kicked out of heaven. But if it's another spirit being, don't worry, you cast them out the same way. The evil rulers of the unseen world, these mighty satanic beings, are great evil princesses of darkness who rule this world. And against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. Hallelujah. That's Ephesians six twelve out of the Living Bible. See, that's the reason that doctors who are not spirit filled and who don't have the discerning of spirit's gift, they can't they can't understand why can't we get cancer healed? And so all the research, and certainly there's a lot of things they learn from medical research and science and praise God for that. For example, I used to cast demons of, of diabetes out. Uh, then I found out it probably might have been caused by that, but it was caused by, uh, in Frances' case, by her getting on cocaine. Don't go around saying Frances on drugs. She was on a thing called sugar, and doctors say that's a cousin to cocaine. You don't know that you're on drugs. Do you? you don't know that you're taking cocaine. She didn't either. But because of that, she killed her pancreas. Well, we'd always cast devils out, but we didn't get many people healed of, of diabetes. But when we found out that you brought on that by eating things that destroyed your body, and you can do it with many things. Sinus, when God spoke to me after a year of suffering, he just said, quit drinking coffee and tea. And of course, I put a lot of sugar in that. And when I quit it, three weeks, I didn't have any more sinus. Just fantastic things that God does. Now, I want to read you just a paragraph out of the book to heal the sick. Uh, let me spot it real quickly. Uh, this, I think, uh, sums up. Well, let me read one more scripture. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Well, see, it was that scripture that God had planted on my heart when I said, God, if that's the devil, get him out and draw close to me. And that's where God got the devil out. Then I learned that I was supposed to do it, but I didn't know how. So God intervened and took him out. Uh, a little paragraph, it's on 167 of the book, don't turn to it now, but it, it's just simply a way that God gave us to describe a little bit more so you can recognize what demons really are. Uh, demons are invisible, bodiless creatures that have the ability to move about wherever Satan sends them, and they can hover over us, surround us, attack us, put thoughts into our mind, put diseases into our bodies, or even cause us to lose our minds and become insane. They can be present at our birth or as we are formed in the belly of our mothers and cause defects in our formation. Being spirits who live forever, they can transfer from one generation to another and thus cause uh, diseases or defects which may be in the form of genes or deformations. They come against our flesh to try to control our souls. We must use all the understanding we can get and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us how to get rid of them in whatever way they attack. Now, in uh, searching for this, we didn't really have anybody uh, to teach us how to heal the sick or how to operate in the nine gifts of the Spirit. Uh, we didn't have anybody to teach us casting out devils. And so Francis and I had to ask God, praise God, we went to the right source. And uh, he began to teach us these things. And of course, we don't know everything, but we're sure gaining. And you can gain with us, and then you can put what you know together, and you're smarter than we are. Hallelujah. Uh, just keep in tune with God. But uh, we ran across the scriptures. And uh, if you uh, paraphrase a paraphrase out of the Living Bibles, where this meant the most to me, but in, in order to cast out devils, uh, the Bible says in Matthew, the 12th chapter, you must first bind the strong man or the devil. Jesus gave us authority over these demons, and we can bind them. And whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So we can literally bind the devil. So how do we do it? We say, devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. But what power do you use to bind them? It says, by the power of the Holy Spirit in Matthew, the 12th chapter. So we say, in the name of Jesus, devil, I bind you by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And then when you go to the 16th chapter of Mark, a good place to look, it just says, Jesus said, cast them out. And so we just say, you 
spirit of cancer, come out in Jesus' name. We repeat in Jesus' name often. You can't say that too much. And so, simply put, when you come up with somebody, they say, I've got deafness. If it is the spirit that caused the deafness, you simply say, devil, in the name of Jesus, I bind you by the power of the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. Now you deaf spirit, come out. When Frances dealt with this deaf mute the other night, she commanded the spirit to come out, and I think that was necessary. And then through that strange, unusual thing that we never heard of before, she commanded his hairs to grow, a defect in his body, created in the formation of his body. You could even go back to the formation of the sperm, the cell that created that body, and it was imperfect if it's uh, generated and command that life to be perfected from the seed on up to now. And it's amazing what that'll do. The simplicity of casting out devils. First of all, know that they are already defeated. You do not fight devils. You cast them out. You do not cast them out of the world. God allowed them to, he sent them to earth, and he gave them certain freedoms. But when they attack a person, you've got absolutely total authority and dominion over those devils that are in a person, if the person will come to you and submit themselves to deliverance. Francis described the homosexual. If they don't agree to get away from it, then the demon's going to stay there. You find some people that just don't want the devils out. Uh, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll invite the devils in, maybe knowingly, maybe not knowingly, but until they're willing to be delivered, uh, then they n normally won't be. Now, most people that you'll meet and most of the deliverances you'll make is simply that they'll have a disease or a mental situation. Alzheimer's, uh, insanity, uh, many of these... In well, Alzheimer's, disease. Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's, uh, well, there's several... Uh, advancing theories on that, but basically they say Alzheimer is when uh, you have a swelling in the brain, you have a deterioration of brain cells. In other words, when brain cells deteriorate, they don't have the ability to think. Uh, we see some people with Alzheimer's, uh, and you'll say, how old are you? Well, uh, 24, 82, 61, they have no idea how old they are. Uh, uh, would you have a cup of coffee? And you put a cup in their hand, now they'll forget they don't even know what they've got the cup for. Uh, they're not, that's not insanity. That's just simply a loss of an ability to use these brain cells. Just like a brain cell destroyed by stroke, you can't use your hand because the signals won't come through. Well, the brain cells cannot uh, actually uh, send signals. They can't send it for you to think. And so you've got to command the spirit of Alzheimer's to come out because it's an incurable disease. Then you command the, uh, the cells to be recreated, the life to come back in those cells, command the swelling to come out in Jesus' name and be healed. I minister to a man back here. have no idea whether he's healed or not. I never, when we get through ministering, we go on to the next person. We don't sit there all day, try to get results that you can see. Because we find many people the next day perfectly normal. Charles, it just reminds me, I have a note on my uh, telephone at the office, actually on my Rolodex file. And it said on April the 12th, this message was called into my secretary. It says, on April the 12th, you prayed for a man in Red Wing, Minnesota, who had Alzheimer's disease. I saw nothing. I saw absolutely nothing. I'm not moved by what I see, hear, feel, taste, touch, or smell. I am moved by what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says when I lay hands on them, they're healed. And I believe that they're healed. It took eight months for that man's doctor to admit that he was totally healed. They took him back, and the doctor noticed the tremendous change, but he said, that's just temporary. That's just temporary. At the end of eight months, after I had cast that spirit of Alzheimer's disease out, that man was totally and completely healed. His doctor says that he is absolutely normal. So there is hope for people who have Alzheimer's disease. Rare is the time we see them healed instantly. I have to tell, I, I will tell you though about one that happened not very long ago. No way, I guess it was. Time flies. How many of you know that? Pretty soon it'll be almost a year ago since this happened. But this man came up to me in a line, obviously a successful businessman. He was very well dressed. And uh, his wife whispered, whispered to me, he has Alzheimer's disease. And so I said to him, what's your name? He said, um, George? Mary, 
Jatsu? He said, honey, what's my name? She said, Bruce, and gave me his last name. And uh, so I said, how old are you? He said, 42, 76, 91, 32, 91, 326. He goes through this whole bunch of numbers. I asked him several questions because I wanted to see the degree of Alzheimer's disease that he had. And he was as nutty as a fruitcake. How many of you know what I'm talking about? He was just as nutty. What? No, I mean, they just absolutely do not. They're not insane in the way we think of a spirit of insanity, but they just can't think. They can't remember from one word to the next word. They can't remember what they're doing. And conversation with them absolutely makes no sense whatsoever because they just don't put the words and the thoughts together. So I laid hands on him and I bound the devil in the name of Jesus. And I said, now you foul spirit of Alzheimer's disease, I command you to come out. I command the swelling in that brain to go down. I command new brain cells to form in Jesus' name. Now I'm looking at this man, totally blank, totally blank, totally blank. He's looking at me and all of a sudden he blinked his eyes and he said, Mrs. Hunter, I want you to know that I enjoyed the service tonight more than any service I've ever had in my entire life. He said, I thought the praise and worship was absolutely wonderful. He said, wasn't it tremendous when we were singing? And he mentioned some song that we were singing. And he was carrying on and carrying on and carrying on. And that was one of the few times that I saw somebody instantly healed of Alzheimer's disease. And you know the interesting thing is, they were taking pictures from my back on this man. And you can see in the pictures when he had Alzheimer's disease and that split section, second when the power of God hit him and all of a sudden he was totally normal and sane again. So remember, nothing is impossible with God. There is no demonic spirit that does not have to bow at the name of Jesus. Sometimes we have to attack him a little more than we normally do. But that's a good thing to remember that Alzheimer's disease can be healed if you can get that stinking spirit out of there in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, one thing you need to do is know how to recognize demons. First of all, the devil is a liar. So you never do say, devil, name yourself. Jesus said that once, and what did they say? We're a legion of them. They did not name themselves. They said we're many, legion, maybe 3,000, maybe 6,000. And Jesus didn't say, sit down, I'm going to drive you out one at a time. He just said, come out. And they all came out at one time. They even went in the pigs and ran the pigs down the cliff. Oink, oink. That's what a devil says. You might be interested to know that sometime a little girl, a timid little girl, will talk like a grown man with a low voice. You might be interested to know that sometime a child or an adult will bark like a dog when they've got a demon. These are in the possessed areas. But what it is, it's not them doing it. The devil has controlled your mind, and whatever the devil puts in your mind, that comes out your mouth. That's why it's so important to spend so much time in the Word of God and in committing yourself to God and doing His work so that the devil has no access to your mind to try to control it. And so they can do it. You find people that, uh, what's that word? I never can remember where people think you lived a long time ago in reincarnation. Uh, see, that's easily explained when you understand demons. Uh, they live forever. They were created as angels back at the beginning. Uh, and they don't die, and they don't fail to remember. See, they're angels, and God didn't take their memory away. He didn't take even a lot of the power away. He just severed his relationship, and so they don't have the connection with God, but they can still even do miracles. And so they can actually come in and put thoughts in your mind, and you think you're Napoleon. And you can tell things about what you did as Napoleon that, uh, that people know about Napoleon, and you don't know. Why is this? Because a demon tells you what to say. And so uh, you can sometimes recognize them that way. Uh, you remember the demoniac that got delivered and he was clothed, and what else? In his right mind. He was not in his right mind when the devil controlled it. Uh, but if you're a Christian, you better be in your right mind and you better be in the Word of God and you better be close to God. You need to be filled with the Spirit of God so that you can communicate with God. And it says, follow after the Holy Spirit. And so as you're yielding yourself to the Spirit of God and following Him, that's the farthest you can get from demon problems in your own life. 
if you're not totally committed to God, then that old fleshly nature will come up. And when you start to get mad at somebody or you have resentment or you have some kind of a thing like smoking cigarettes or, or drinking or something, you said, I can't quit it. Yes, you can. That's what it is. You're exalting yourself above God. That's what the devil did in heaven before he got cast out. I want to be like God. You smoke a cigarette after you're a Christian and God speaks to you and says, don't want you to do that. It's bad for your health and it's a bad witness. Well, that's all right, God. I can't quit. And so what it is, you're rebelling against God. One of the two great sins that will take you out from under the blood of Jesus is rebellion and idolatry. You can read that in the Bible. You can also find the scripture in the book Angels on Assignment. Those can take you out from under the covering of Jesus. Rebellion and idolatry. But what rebellion is, is when you want your right over God. And so if you want to smoke a cigarette or you want to keep getting mad at people when God has spoken to you about it and you do it again, you're rebelling against God and who are you worshiping? An idol called self. Yes, baby. Evil spirits and okay, a difference between evil spirits and attitudes. You tell them. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It didn't draw back to my mind what she was right. Many people get involved in casting out devils. and they, How many of you think that casting out devils is exciting? It is. It's one of the wildest, most exciting parts of the Christian ministry, and yet people get hung up. I remember when, when I was saved, I was saved just about the time that the church became a, a, a aware of the fact that demons are really here today. You know, for many years, the church stuck its head in the sand like an ostrich, and they said, oh, Christian, you know, you don't even mention demons in churches because Christians don't have anything to do with them. Well, you might not have anything to do with them, but they have something to do with you. And so then we went through a period where the pendulum swung the other way. Now, how many of you have been saved long enough to remember the way the pendulum swung the other, the other way? And they'd say, ah, there's a spirit of microphone. Ah cast that spirit of microphone out or cast that spirit of dust out if there was a piece of dust on the floor or cast that spirit of wire out because the, the, the microphone has a wire people saw demons on everything and they spent half of their day half of their lifetime casting devils out I remember that there were people who used to go through their house literally with a broom every day sweeping and say come on all you little demons all you devils come out of here and then they'd, they'd get out they'd get to the door open the door uh, sweep this imaginary imaginary stuff out the door and then slam the door and say, well, I got rid of the devils for the day. We got so hung up on demons, it was absolutely pathetic. Now, how many of you have not been saved that long? And you've never heard about it. All right. I remember when I first got saved, they used to have the brown bag services. And have you ever been to a brown bag service? You've never been to a brown? We well, ought to go. Hallelujah. Uh, but I tell you, yeah, I, yeah, that's what Charles said. I understand that some of them are breaking out again. Let me tell you this. Well, you see, this was because somebody went through, a, the, somebody got a demon cast out of them, and I guess they vomited. Well, then everybody said you couldn't have a demon cast out unless you vomited. And so when you'd go into these services, they would have rolls of paper towel at the end of every, at the end of every aisle. Everybody got a little brown bag when they came in, and that was to cast, so for you to put the devils in when you vomited them up. I mean, if you haven't lived that long, you just haven't lived to understand why people, <laughs> why some people get turned off when you talk about devils because th there was such an overindulgence in it. Everybody was casting out devils. If your hair was turning gray, they cast out the devil of gray hair. If you got bald, they cast out the spirit of baldness. I mean, it didn't make any difference what it was. Uh, if you got sick, I mean, well, it didn't make any difference. I mean, I don't care what happened. If your car broke down, they cast out the spirit of broken car. They would just cast out anything. And they'd look for doorknobs on the back. They'd look for demons on the back of doorknobs. I mean, they'd look for demons. And every Everybody was looking at everybody else and, and thinking about all the demons. She's got the demon of closed eyes out there. Hallelujah. Now, I, I mean, it didn't, make any, it didn't make any difference what it was. It was a demon. But praise God, we got over that. However, during this, we also came to confuse attitudes with demonic spirits. There are many people who have... Uh, who have attitudes that really are not demonic spirits. You need to get your attitudes cleaned up. How many of you don't understand what I'm talking about? All right. Like there are some people who will say, we'll talk about a spirit of depression. Depression can be a spirit, 
but that's it can be caused by the fact that you allowed yourself to continue thinking about yourself poor little me poor little me poor little me I have so many problems I have so many troubles I have this and then you get depressed because you think of all the things that happened to you I remember that I used to get up every morning before I got saved and I would I would always tell people that I had such terrible bad luck I mean I lost my mother I lost my father I lost my husband before I was 35 years of age and I tell you I used to have the greatest pity party poor little me here I am a widow I got two kids I got a support I mean and 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 I lost my mother I lost my father lost my husband before I was 35 years of age I just had the greatest pity parties can you imagine me having a a pity party I mean I, I that's so foreign to my nature isn't it Charles I tell you I was just feeling so sorry for myself and every morning I'd wake up and I would say I wonder what awful thing is going to happen to me today and you know what it happened <laughs> You see, because even though I wasn't saved, I was calling into being those things which be not as though they were. I mean, I just knew that every day was going to be terrible. I just knew that every day I was going to be filled with problems. Praise God I got saved. Oh, praise God I got saved. Because you see, actually, as much as anything else, now I believe in my case that was probably a spirit depressing me, but many times depression is an attitude self pity is an attitude rather than a demonic spirit it's because we allow ourselves to indulge in feeling sorry for myself oh but Francis you don't have the problems like I have you don't understand I mean you never had any problems you gotta be kidding you got to be kidding. <laughs> if I were to write my life story before, I've only written after I got saved. If I were to write my life story before I got saved, you'd never believe all I've been through. But all I can say is this. Praise God. When you're born again, you possess the mind of Christ. And what happened in those years before that do not exist anymore. They absolutely do not exist anymore. That's because of the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ and his ability to make you a new creature. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a brand new shiny creature, and the old things have passed away. We hang on to attitudes because we feel sorry for ourselves. I think most of the time that most attitudes come because we feel sorry for ourselves. And yet many people think it's a demonic spirit that's attacking him, and yet they're really reveling in the fact that I'm always depressed I go into every prayer line and I have I have and then they'll come to me and say I had Kenneth Hagen pray for me I've had Kenneth Copeland I've had Oral Roberts I've had Marilyn Hickey and they go right down the line and they say I'm still depressed will you cast the spirit on me no I say get your mind off yourself the minute you begin thinking about somebody else that's why you see going into the healing ministry and wanting to lay hands upon the sick is such a blessing because then you are transferring your thought about yourself you are transferring it to wanting to help somebody else and you'll discover how all of your attitudes change when you begin to do this when you begin to give out instead of turning in because there are so many attitudes worry is not a spirit and yet I've had people ask me if I'd cast out the spirit of worry. That's a habit that you've gotten into. Begin to think on the good things of life. You know, instead of worrying, what I would remember when I told you that when the doctor told me I had diabetes, do you realize I could have gone apart? I could have thought, oh, I'll never be able to minister again. I, that didn't never dawned on my in my mind whatsoever. Did you notice what I did? Instead of saying, poor little me. No, I've got diabetes. I'll have to take insulin the rest of my life. I said, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. You see, <laughs> and I believed in the healing power of God. And this is what so many of us need to do. We get, need to get our attitudes changed so that we begin to think about the things of God. We begin to think about the promise and we don't think about the, the problem that we have. If we look at the answer instead of the problem, it's amazing how those demonic spirits will let you alone. Now, Charles, what have you got? Have you got some other input on attitudes over demonic spirits? 
It's very, very simple. It, uh, everything that's of the devil will point back to where the devil started from, exalting self. And so if you find that you've got yourself even not possessed but influenced or are beginning to be controlled by demons, you'll discover that you can't forgive somebody. You can't, uh, uh, you can't get rid of this attitude or you can't get rid of this habit. And then all it is is doing what the devil did. You're exalting self, you're idolizing yourself, and you're rebelling against God. When you don't do what God tells you to do, you're rebelling. When Francis and I gave our whole lives to God, made a total, absolute surrender to God, we didn't hold back anything, uh, then there was no problem because, uh, I, could you believe it, a certified public accountant, I saved $2 million on one, one transaction in a client's uh, planning of his estate, uh, a high executive, and I used to get my feelings hurt, and I'd go home and pout for two or three nights feeling sorry for me. I didn't realize it, that I was exalting self. That was, we that was before we were married. You better believe it. That was before Jesus and I got married too. Hallelujah. Yeah, because see, when you die to self, and that's why it's so important to make a total commitment, that's why the baptism with fire is going to be so significant as God begins to release that. And more and more we're seeing the evidence of it as people say, God, I don't care what you do. And when I said, God, take all of my life and make me spiritually what you want me to be. And as if I took Charles and all of his possessions, all of his friends, everything that I was, and I threw it at God, and I didn't take it back. That's simply what is going to free you of anything of that area. Now, in recognizing demons, just a little more word about that. Uh, first of all, they're liars. Don't need to ask them about it. If you need to ask, and if you need to know what it is, what spirit it is, uh, then ask God. Uh, unzip your mind. Open your mind up and say, God, let me know. And uh, you may find it out by questioning somebody. It may be from knowledge uh, that it's incurable. If they say, well, the doctors can't find a cause or cure of it, cast the spirit out. Uh, one time a man came up and he had his leg cut off, amputated. And, uh, and so he came up to him. He had an artificial leg. And he came up to him in a prayer line that night. And he said, I got pain in my right foot. And I started laying. I said, isn't that the one that got cut off? He said, yeah. He said, they call it a phantom pain. I said, in Jesus' name, devil, I bind you. Now, you phantom spirit, come out in the name of Jesus. Came out just like that. Uh, unzip your mind, though, because uh, uh, we caution you about uh, uh, hitting the Bible a great long period of two minutes a day, uh, not even thinking about God during the day, except he passes your mind enough to say, God, would you do this for me? I mean, get in the Word of God. Give your life to him and follow after the Spirit, and he'll take you into operating in any gift that he needs to use for you to do the job he assigns to you. But if you're not doing anything for God, you don't need the discerning of spirits because you wouldn't know how to cast them out anyway. So that's why it's so close to draw close to God and do the things he wants you to do and that total submission will clear you from that um, one time a lady came up and I was ministering at an altar and this was early in her ministry and uh, she said I backed away from God I've sinned I've been in sin 25 years but I want to get right with God so I led her in a sinner's prayer she accepted Jesus and I said now you need to baptize the Holy Spirit so that you got power to recognize and resist that devil among other powers that you receive when you got God living in you. And I said, now I'm going to lay hands on you. I'm going to ask Jesus to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I want you to look up to God. I want you to begin to praise God in tongues uh, in a language you don't know as the Spirit gives the other. And I started to lay hands and she said, I don't want to do that. I thought, well, I had another Baptist or another one out of my church or something that had been taught against tongues. But the Spirit, discerning of Spirit, I said, devil, I bind you by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, you deceiving spirit of religion, come out of her in Jesus' name. Jesus baptized the Holy Spirit. See, just simply let God lead you into these things, and you'll discover. But please don't go up to somebody and say, hey, you got a demon. Constantly people come up and say, my son's got a demon. I always say, what makes you think so? And sometimes the child does have a demon, but most of the time it's probably mama. Hallelujah.